Gemma's given me a great leader in, she's right, the film industry is the most wonderful, wonderful industry to deal in. And one of the reasons it's wonderful is there is no such thing as it can't be done. Obviously there are financial constraints, other constraints, but your job is to deliver something that works for the audience. So the subtext, in a sense, of what I want to talk about this morning is that it is not impossible. What I'm going to lay out is tough, difficult, but not at all impossible. My subject will be uh, climate change, climate change. And my object, the next 15 minutes, is to get you as justifiably angry as I possibly can. <laughs> so please, please, please do not expect a lot of jokes or laughs, because I, I wish I had them. I really do. Also, I would urge you, the examples I'm going to offer, go online afterwards, check my sources, check my references, double check that I'm not uh, trying to fill you with unnecessary fears or concerns or I'm using the wrong metaphors. I'm, I really sincerely hope I won't. Now the first obvious question is, what is a septuagenarian ex-film producer doing on a stage talking about climate change? Well the great thing is I do have a little bit of form. Seven years ago, to my great good fortune really, I chaired the committee, parliamentary committee, that put through Parliament the world's first climate change act, setting fixed targets, carbon uh, targets and binding targets uh, that Britain is today forced to deal with or find a way around. So I do a bit of history. I'm very proud of what I did. I'm very proud of the people I work with. Most important of all, I got the opportunity for a year to interrogate and take evidence from people from around the world, from China, the United States, everybody. So we became as a committee pretty pretty damn expert. Also worth mentioning that we got this bill through with remarkably little resistance, cross-party. So one of the very good things, 2007, was that here was a bill, the world's first climate change bill, which people took real pleasure in it being the world's first, and with, as I say, remarkable lack of, uh, of unpleasantness and, uh, and controversy. I want to ask you to develop your anger through um, four prisms, really. Economic, health, environmental, sustainability, and leadership. I should say leadership or the lack of it. So I'm going to kick off, if I may, with the economic. Listen to this. It may sound like a very odd sound to put on an image of a slave ship, and that's what it was. This was the design of a ship of how many slaves you could cross the Atlantic with uh, and uh, maximize the profits of the slave owners. The, one of the great arguments 200 years ago, a little over 200 years ago, against the abolition of slavery was an economic argument. It was claimed that 25% of the UK's economic activity was entirely related to slavery and the benefits derived in the UK from slavery. 25%. And therefore, it would be hopelessly uneconomic to abolish slavery. And William Wilberforce and those who supported him had to deal with that argument for 20 years. 20 years. In the end, they did manage to win it. And a lot of that energy got transferred into a new form of energy. But it's still energy. What the slaves were, was providing the energy that drove the British economy, and the Industrial Revolution brought a new form of energy. But what was important was, the new form of energy was built around innovation. Once there weren't slaves to rely on, once there weren't this cheap, appear, apparently plentiful form of energy, they had to develop new forms of energy. And the slave owners, many of them, hopefully, helped, went out of business, and a new group of mill owners were not the greatest people in the world. But Britain's economy, far from tanking, which is what had been predicted, grew as never before. The development of the, of the Industrial Revolution literally was bound up in the surge of innovation and confidence that led for the abolition of slavery. So the economic argument that, that kept slavery on the statute books for years was demolished within 30 years. I just would like to hold, as I say, hold that thought. What they were actually doing was engaged in a disregard for human suffering at the, in the pursuit of profit. And that card's going to turn up at least twice more. Now, through the prism of health. Uh, last month, this extraordinary man, Died. He was the Surgeon General of the United States uh, from 69 to 72. A very brave man. He took on the tobacco companies. And it was he who pushed through the very first warning, that warning, on packs of cigarettes. 
um, he was, they managed to lobby in order to get rid of him. He was got rid of by the Nixon administration in 1972. He continued the whole of the rest of his life to argue the same case, but they got shot of him. In 1997, Congress, 25 years later, Congress called the leading figures in the tobacco industry to give evidence about the impacts of tobacco. Now, these guys have had 25 years of medical evidence on their desks. They knew exactly the situation. Here, thanks to YouTube, is what they said. Let me uh, begin my questioning on the matter of uh, whether or not nicotine is addictive. Let me ask you first, and I'd like to just go down the row, uh, whether each of you believes uh, that nicotine is not addictive. I heard virtually all of you touch on it, and just yes or no. Do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Congressman, cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. There is no right. intoxication. We'll, we'll take that as a no, and again, time is short. If you could just, I think each of you believe nicotine is not addictive. We just would like to have this for the record. I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And I too believe that nicotine is not addictive. So, nine years after, a second Surgeon General had unequivocally shown that nicotine was addictive, these lunatics were still claiming it wasn't. They've now kind of given up trying to persuade us. They've moved their uh, wares to the third world and are now pushing cigarettes wherever they can in the Philippines and anywhere else. This is a classic example of the impact of deniability. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people died because they clung on to this notion that there was no causal link, was the phrase. There was no proven causal link between cigarettes and lung cancer. Thousands of people died. This man, Ralph Nader, check him out, saved my life. He also saved the life of hundreds of thousands of other people. He fought for 20 years with General Motors for the installation of seatbelts in cars. He had an amazing amount of evidence. General Motors not only fought him, they also blackmailed him. They followed him. They did everything possible to discredit him, to the point that Senator Bobby Kennedy required General Motors' chairman to come to the Congress and personally apologize to Mr. Nader for what they'd done to him. He saved thousands of lives in the face of the denial of the automobile industry that seatbelts were valuable. So these are two more examples of organizations disregarding human suffering in the pursuit of profit. I had a, a bad car crash in Italy three years ago. I would not be here. There's no question about that. I would not be here but for Ralph Nader. Go on to the next one, environmental sustainability. This is a, a tough one. I think that as human beings, we are not unlike gerbils. We're kind of great at the fight or flight thing. We're great when we sense danger at jumping up, looking around and spotting it and, and reacting. We're good at it. It's what's kept us on this planet all these years. What we're terrible at, terrible at, is dealing with slow burn issues. Issues that just get worse and worse and worse in the background and which on a day-to-day -day basis we can kind of put in the back of our minds and not get too engaged with. We are very, very susceptible to what I would term slow, slow burn issues. Now, I'm a child of the 60s. I was brought up with this mantra. I believed it then. I believe it, if anything, more powerfully now. Basically, unless you're prepared to become part of the answer, you are, by definition, part of the problem. And this is, nowhere could this be more true than in the uh, area of environmental sustainability. I also think that Nelson Mandela, as usual, was right when he says that in order to solve these problems, we can't just address them with our expectations, we actually have to exceed our expectations. All of you will know the uh, notion that uh, the planet is finite, but that if we all want to live in the way that the West lives, we will require five planets. Five planets that aren't five planets. Let me make one very important point. Don't worry about the planet. The planet is fine. We're the problem. 
The planet can live perfectly happy and will continue for billions of years to come very, very happily without us. It is we who the planet is probably fed up with. And with good reason, I might add. Now, it's not that we didn't know about this. This is the first edition of a book written 50 years ago, over 50 years ago, by Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. We were warned 50 years ago that what we were doing was unsustainable. We were warned that what we were doing was lethal to our own future. As I say, because it's been a slow burn issue, we chose to nod, make nice noises, and ignore it. Tom Friedman, a couple of months ago, this wonderful writer in the New York Times, I think he's absolutely right when he says this. How we make the transition to a stabilized and still prosperous relationship with the Earth and each other is surely the story of our time. A bit more evidence. The insurance industry. I don't know if you can read these. These are the biggest, most expensive disasters of 2012. The insurance industry has woken up and is really now beginning to take these issues very, very seriously. In fact, last week, I say, yeah, uh, it may have been earlier this week, the CEO of one of the world's biggest insurance companies, Aviva, said this. And he is, it's great that the industry is beginning to step up and say this. Try to imagine, if you will, an uninsurable world. Try and imagine an uninsurable environment for yourselves. Uninsurable houses, uninsurable anything. The insurance company is saying very clearly, the insurance industry is saying very clearly, unless we alter things, they cannot remain in business in an affordable manner. That's to say, the premiums will charge, they will be forced to charge, we won't possibly be able to pay. Now, here's the challenge to you. This also is exactly right. We're the first generation to feel the impact of climate change and the very last generation, certainly in the people in this hall, to be able to do anything about it. Because if we continue to stick our heads in the ground, if we continue to act like gerbils and not like sensible, long-term people, if we continue to do that, we will undoubtedly face, and it certainly won't be us, the consequences. This morning at breakfast, there were a couple of very young people with us. It is our children and our children's children that will suffer. We may just escape okay. I will. I'm 73 years old. I'll certainly, with, unless I'm very unlucky, get out of... <laughs> I, will, I will get off this... I'll get off this planet, you know. I mean, let's be fair. None of us are going to leave this place alive, right? We're, at some point, we're all going to face this. But this is not a sustainable future, and yet this is the actual reality of any number of cities in the world today. And why? Because we have an economic environment which is prepared, last time I'll show it, I promise you, is prepared to proceed disregarding human suffering in the pursuit of profit. We've been sucked into the belief that an economic system that we use and work with is the only possible way forward. And in truth, unless we alter the system, it is the absolute certainty that it will see the end of us as a species. Maybe by the end of the century, maybe beyond. Last point I want to make is about leadership. This is self-evident. The first step in solving a problem is to recognize that there is one. Now, we don't have a bad record in this particular instance. In 1961, I was newly married, and my wife and I went to bed in November 1961, really, 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 not sure that there was going to be a tomorrow morning. Many of your parents, many of your parents would have had the same experience. We really didn't know, this is the Cuban Missile Crisis, we really didn't know if there was going to be a tomorrow. And yet, fortunately, two statesmen decided to step back and do the right thing. So we're back to Gemma's point. Human beings given the right circumstances, given the right leadership, given the right opportunities, can do the right thing. We don't have to be stupid people. We can do the right thing. And remember, the anti-Vietnam War protests, which I was involved, the Iraq War protests, these people weren't wrong. These people were not wrong. They were actually right, and subsequent events have proved them to be right. So the notion that somehow action is ignored, yes, it may be. But you also are in a position, as I am, to say, actually, I was there. I was right. I may have been ignored. 
We may not stop the war when we want to do, but I was right. That's not a bad thing to begin to drift towards uh, your last days thinking, I promise you. Last time I was on TED, I did a talk on what we term the duty of care. I believe profoundly in the duty of care. I think it's a phrase we kick about a lot. Duty of care to children, duty of care to armed forces, duty of care to the elderly. We have a duty of care to each other, and we have an overriding duty of care to future generations. We have to start exercising it. There is no other possible way. We have to exercise the duty of care, and we have to work out for ourselves what that really means to us. What can we do? This wonderful, wonderful phrase of Franklin Roosevelt. There's a mysterious cycle in human events. To some generations, much is given. Of other generations, much is expected. This generation has a rendezvous with destiny. I'm here to tell you, this generation has an absolute rendezvous with destiny. And just like the movie industry, if you are prepared to accept that anything is possible, then go out there and make it possible. Thank you very much.